Wonderful. Well, thank you all. It's so lovely to be here and to see you. And thank you so much uh, for inviting me to give the talk. It started out just as uh, I'd love to meet, and then here we are. So this is a real honor. Thank you very much. Um, so um, a little bit about me. I know that uh, you've just heard a little bit about my uh, background, but um, I, I'd like to just chat a little bit about how I got into photography. I'd been interested in photography since I was a young child. Um, and when I went to university, I wanted to take some photography classes. Um, but at that time, uh, it was required that you had um, your own manual camera, and my family said, we can't afford that. So I put it on hold and did other things. And I finally uh, did buy that camera a little bit later when I was working. And I started traveling around the world, and I took my trusty camera with me. Um, and then I had a chance to go to graduate school um, to take a break in my career, and I thought, if I can do anything, what is it? I want to go and study photography. So I was able to do that in my late 30s, um, so never give up, <laughs> and uh, went and did a master's degree in photographic studies. I was living in London at the time. I finished it just as I turned 40, and uh, since then I've been working in photography um, and in education. So I've been able to uh, grow my photographic practice. I'm very much focusing on the art side of, um, of the work as opposed to the commercial elements. Um, if I'd started earlier, I would have gone into commercial photography, but I came to it a little late for that. Um, and I think that uh, really telling my, my story as an artist is kind of what is most important to me in, in the photography. Uh, at this moment in time. So uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania in the US um, and then I at one point moved to London. I went for three months but I ended up staying for 16 years. Uh, while I was there I met my husband uh, who is here in the room in this lovely striped shirt, Sanjay, and, um, and then uh, he's here from Chennai. So uh, since then um, I've gotten to come to Chennai frequently, and we come every year. Um, his family has, uh, with very open arms, welcomed me. And so much of my work uh, has been around this uh, sort of identity of being uh, here in a new city, but it's my home in many ways, but I don't know it, and you know, learning my family, learning our, uh, the culture, the traditions. And so while I've been here, I've used my camera to help me explore um, mostly our, our home, actually. I mean, that's where we're, where we're mostly spending time because we're here for such a short period of time. So a little bit of the work I'm going to share today relates to that. And, um, of course, I photograph many other things. Um, and uh, I photograph a, a lot of things when I say it's about my personal narrative. Um, I've used materials that my mother... Uh, taught Bible stories with when I was a child, and I've recontextualized them uh, in a different environment. I photographed all of my daughter's shoes for a year. I photographed her broken toys to kind of hang on to those memories. Um, and of course, when I travel, I photograph. And when I'm out in the world, I'm just seeing photographs all the time in my mind. So when I realized I was seeing about a thousand photographs a day, I thought it was time to go take that photography class. <laughs> so maybe you can relate. How many of you here are photographers in the room? Great, yeah, good, w wonderful. So you know, <laughs> you're seeing it, you know. So, um, so I'll share a little bit of my work uh, here in, in Chennai. Um, I, I have a collection called the Bindi Collection, and um, this is something that started on my first journey to Chennai, uh, maybe 12 or so years ago, maybe a little more than that. And um, I was in our home and uh, realized that there were these red dots on the mirrors and on the walls. <laughs> and and I, I, you know, you may be familiar with this, but it was completely new to me. And uh, my mother-in-law, who is here in the room, swears they're not hers, but, <laughs> but, um, but I'm pretty sure many of them were hers. And um, so... I have about 30 of these images, and uh, they are ongoing. In fact, I found one in the house just the other day. Um, so I think that, um, you know, as you observe these little details, I began to sort of uh, try to understand uh, wh why are they there? What, do you d what is this? And so uh, she says they're not hers, but the first time I photographed it, there was one dot, and the next day there were two. And <laughs> the only person in the house wearing a bindi was my mother-in-law, so I'm pretty sure they're hers. <laughs> but it's been a way to really get to understand culture, understand habits, to get to know uh, my family member who is, I, I'm new in the house. So, uh, so even just the other day, I found another uh, bindi in the house. 
Um, and, uh, and then uh, she came to London and um, I found one or two or three in our London home as well. So I'm waiting for one in Boston and I feel like when it shows up in Boston, maybe my collection is complete. So, <laughs> um, so it's been really kind of fun and I have a real affection for these images and, and um, it's, it's observing culture, but it's also connecting to my mother-in-law. Um, and when I show these images, they're only four by six because it's about intimacy. I'm in an intimate space. Uh, I'm dealing with an intimate habit. And so they're, they're small, small pieces when I show them. Another body of work is called the, thir oops, sorry, it's called the Third Eye. Um, and this was taken on maybe my second or my third trip here to Chennai. Um, my husband and my father-in-law went away to um, a temple for a few days and I was home with the family. And um, you know, I don't speak Tamil. And um, so a lot of time was sort of spent with them, but you know, I, I, at some point, the, the soap operas were on, and so I was like, what do I do? I don't have access to them linguistically. So I visually started really engaging with the, with the um, soap operas. And of course, uh, again, being an, uh, someone who's not from here, I found the music fascinating, the, the way the cinematography was done at such a highly dramatic way. Dum, 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 dum. <laughs> and so I was trying to capture those moments between scenes where you would get an even heightened dramatic effect. And so our visual eye uh, watching um, didn't see necessarily this, but the camera through a slow time uh, exposure was able to capture uh, intersections of scenes. So uh, when I was editing the work, uh, I ended up sort of going for that third eye concept. And of course, that's you know, the third eye with regards to the, with, you know, the seat of consciousness, but also the camera, also the TV. There are many layers in which this sort of viewing um, is occurring. So I edited the work down to sort of really be focusing on that concept of, of visually representing the third eye. Um, and I have about 30 images in this series. And so, you know, you can see the, the scenes are intersecting. So you've got the patient whose eye is here, and then you've got the nurse who's there. And, and you know, we wouldn't have seen that with our own naked eye, but the camera was able to, to trace that. And then a, a, th a third body of work from Chennai is called Morning Poetry. And um, in the mornings, uh, the home is quite peaceful, and there's a lot of prayer. Um, and so um, there's prayer and cooking. That seems to be <laughs> what's happening in the mornings. And um, so I, one, one day with my iPhone, kind of wandered around in the quiet space with the, with the chanting going on and just photographed the home. Um, and I ended up uh, with this body of work. It's about 20 images. And I'm going to show all 20 because it's a poem. So I can't just show you five. And so here we go. And I, and I wrote a poem, and I'll read it quickly at the end. But these are scenes that are probably very familiar to you. <laughs> but um, a way for me to just appreciate the family home and the family. I'm especially interested in the human touch the flowers being placed, um, the way in which we interact with our environment, we leave little touches of human intervention. And this is the end of the poem. Um, and this image uh, is leading to the next body of work that I've been working on called Yesterday's Flowers. And I've been photographing the puja flowers the day after in the like five minutes between the time they get put into the, uh, the dustbin area and they get whisked away. Um, so I've been working on that. Uh, but here's the poem, Morning Poetry. The early echoes of temple chants 
beeping autos and street wallas calling out their jasmine and green beans as they roll by on squeaky wheels encourage the morning light to gently but unapologetically brush my brow. Uncle's prayers are rhythmically calling, the broom brush is sweeping, swooshing, to carry away the dust from yesterday. Ama filters coffee for her menfolk, and it's warm milk for Betty and masala tea for me. The sun is rising fast, so it won't miss anything that this sacred day has to offer. So, as I said, this work is a poem, and I uh, created the images on five-inch square glass plates, and they hung together as, as one piece. Um, and so um, the curator at the museum where I work chose to hang them in this staggering of the imagery, and I think whoever's hanging it will have their own way of connecting the, uh, the phrases of the imagery. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of, of how it's a poem on the wall. <laughs> so, um, and then I wanted to shift a little bit to my work at the museum, um, the Griffin Museum of Photography. Uh, this is a museum outside of Boston. Uh, it is quite a powerful little museum. And if you come there, you think it's small, um, it's out of town, but the director of the museum is sought after across the United States to jury shows, to do portfolio reviews. Um, she's internationally followed as well. So this little museum is actually very important in the photography fine art scene in the US. And so I'm very fortunate to be able to work there. I work there part time. I'm the director of programs, which means I organize talks like this. Um, I'm usually standing where Shuchi was standing. <laughs> and, um, and I uh, help organize portfolio reviews. Uh, we had a photography festival last year that I helped uh, very much organize and uh, work with the artists in the area and organize um, educational programs, et cetera. So it's an important museum to know about. And um, so for, you, know, you could follow it on uh, Instagram or on Facebook and see what's going on there. And, and um, our director is just uh, kind of thought of as the patron saint of photographers uh, in the US. And so um, a real privilege to work for the Griffin Museum. It's a nonprofit organization. Um, its sole purpose is to heighten the uh, sort of photography and particularly fine art photography. Um, we show all kinds of genres, uh, but there seems to be this real specific um, focus on the fine art area. Um, we have about 60 exhibitions a year in our various spaces. We have three galleries in the museum and we have three satellite spaces and we also do some online programming. So uh, a few years ago we had a show called Zindigi and we had several uh, Indian uh, American based Indian artists who showed work and some of my work was shown at that time also. Um, and so we try to really um, bring together uh, various themes uh, try to expand um, people's thinking. During that Zindig Zindigi show, we had an online uh, exhibition and we had Waswo ex Waswo. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's based in Rajasthan. Um, so we had his work uh, shown online. Uh, it was really lovely to have that connected to the Zindigi show. So we try to like pull things together in, in a way that, that makes some thematic sense. Um, we also have an annual jury show, so we'll call in somebody to juror um, the members' uh, work, and then there'll be a show. So this year there's 60 different artists whose work has been selected and then has to be kind of put together in a thematic way. Um, so it's a great way to get exposure uh, to, to the fine art photography world. We do portfolio reviews, talks, programs, and community, and I think very similar to what I think the Chennai Biennale is trying to do is really build community and um, you know, very much um, highlight the, the art of photography. So I wanted to show you some work of some of the Boston community artists. And I wanted to show this work because I wanted to bring some of Boston to you. Um, and also, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fine art piece. And I was looking at the, just while waiting, I see up here on the wall it says create. And I think you know, so much about photography um, and about it being an artist is about creating and about your, your own personal vision and journey. So I just thought I'd share a few of these artists whose work I admire 
Um, this is Astrid Reiswitz. She's German, based in Boston. And she's been doing a body of work called Stories from the Kitchen Table. And this is work that started in her family farm in Germany. The farm is no longer functioning. Uh, no one's living there. Um, it's kind of in the way, the way into the past. Um, but she goes back and photographs there. And then she uses her current life and kind of interjects it. So this is her daughter. And this is a, a, some sort of a relic from the farm that she's wearing around her neck. And she sort of goes across time with, um, and history and tries to connect the past and the present in these images. And so I've just got three from each of these artists just to give you a taste. This is another one from the kitchen table stories. And these um, embroideries are things that like her great grandmother embroidered. So it's very personal, um, uh, China from the family home, et cetera. And so you know, kind of pulling them in together, uh, past and present. Another artist is Edie Bressler. She's uh, the director of photography at Simmons College in Boston. Um, she's getting uh, quite great acclaim, um, and one of her bodies of work was photographing lottery winners at the store where they purchased the lottery ticket, and that got to be quite a well-known series. This series called Anonymous uh, is something she started while she was sick. She was ill for one year, and she said, I looked at books more than I made work. And she found a book of um, photographs uh, from the 1920s of nude imagery. And she, as she was getting better, started to scan those nude images uh, onto clear film. And then she would just juxtapose it against a backdrop. And then she started clothing it. <laughs> and so then she started embroidering. And, and there's actual threads and things through the work. And so she was using these figures and the act of clothing them as a way to kind of rejuvenate and regenerate them and and um and heal so this is her uh, three of her images from anonymous and this one is actually physically hanging in our museum right now and it's got sequins that she's hand sewn onto the onto the image and this just won a prize from our director so you know it's about um kind of concept as well as just beautiful pictures. It's also about this following through an idea and sort of taking it where, where it can go. This artist, Fran Foreman, um, she's um, very well known for a lot of her collage work, very beautiful work. Uh, this is a new series called Crossroads and uh, she's kind of making a, I don't know if it's a political statement, but um, it's about this transitional time, and certainly in our country, there's a lot of transition and a lot of stress, I'd say, right now, socially, politically. And so I think she's using this work as a way to kind of explore that tension, um, and, and she, it's in this in-between time. And so she's referring to uh, Dutch masters in terms of lighting, uh, using that for her portraiture, finding abandoned spaces, um, and creating this work. It's quite different from her collage work, but um, it's quite beautiful. And, and uh, there's a lot of similarities in terms of the, the texture and the colors that she's using, but these are straight shots as opposed to collage. This is Gregory Albertson. Um, he's made these otherworldly images um, moonscapes, if you will, uh, by uh, photographing tree bark. And so <laughs> this is tree bark that's been digitally processed in an alternative way to bring you moonscapes. <laughs> so pretty impressive. He's done a lot of close-ups of tree bark as well, which are a little bit more literal. Um, but this has to do with um, stacking and HDR and all kinds of technical things that I've not gone down that road to explore, but he clearly has done so. This is the intimate distance. And this was on show at a little pop-up gallery that we had a couple years ago. This is Iritza Menjavar. She's actually the associate director of the museum, and uh, she's in her mid-20s, so really early in her sort of photographic career but already been featured by the New York Times and several others uh, in terms of her work. She's um, investigating being a first-generation immigrant. Her parents brought her to the States um, when she was very, very young, 
and now her generation is all in their early 20s and how do they support their families? How have they, um, what is their responsibility? And so this work is, uh, again, very important politically at this moment in time in our country. So it's getting a lot of acclaim. So her generation carries the responsibility of the dream of her parents. This is Joshua Sarniana. Um, he's a, a neuroscientist and he's based at MIT. And um, this is one of the iconic buildings at MIT. It's by Frank Gehry. And he's been photographing it in various lighting juxtapositions over the years. And it's all deeply psychological, this work. Um, but um, He's really quite interesting in, in the work that he produces. I've seen, his work is quite varied, but this particular body of work I think is really strong and it's a little bit about our psyche. It's about dark and light. It's about, you know, how do we access meaning? This is Lou Jones. Uh, he's on the other end of his career, um, probably in his mid to late 70s. He's uh, been a very successful commercial photographer. He's photographed many of the Olympics. Um, he's been on a personal quest to photograph all the countries in Africa um, today so that we have imagery that isn't just about poverty and isn't just about um, sort of what we're used to seeing. So he's been going each summer for many weeks and photographing um, in Africa. And he's now in the process of putting a book together. He's got a Kickstarter campaign uh, to get the book out there. This is Tira Khan. Um, she is photographing portraits mostly and really on that rise in her uh, recognition in the region for her work. And uh, this is her daughter's 13th birthday uh, party. <laughs> and so uh, she's been doing a series of photographing her daughters um, as they grow. This image is called No More Braids, right? No More Braids. It's 13, it's her 13th birthday party. It's the end of the night. Um, you can tell there's been some fun partying going on there, <laughs> right? Um, but it's a quiet moment. And um, this image uh, was, uh, she submitted it to a show that I curated, an online show, and I, uh, I gave her first prize for this one. I think it's really strong. <laughs> so, um, and this is the third in that series that she submitted. And this is Yorgos Epthamiadis, if I've said that correctly, uh, domesticated uh, seeing past seduction. He's a, a Greek uh, artist who's based in Boston. Um, he's gotten quite uh, a lot of interest in this particular body of work. Um, he's photographed antique guns in the homes or the spaces of the people who own these antique guns. And uh, the reason he made this work is that he grew up with this relic of an antique gun from his family history in his home. And he said, it always hung over my head, reminding me of our violent past. It always disturbed me. And now I wanted to make work to help me figure out why this is upsetting me so much, et cetera. So he's, um, he's photographed uh, these handguns you know, against curtains, against sofas, et cetera, in the homes of the people who currently collect them. And then Yorgos uh, is quite a well-connected uh, person in the art scene, and he decided he was going to curate his own shows regularly in his kitchen on his fridge. And so this is the curated fridge, which has gained great notoriety. Um, and uh, every two months, he has a new curator who curates the prints. So you have to send in physical prints and um, then the curator will curate those and they'll put it together a show and he'll have an opening in his kitchen and anyone can come. <laughs> and then um, it's been traveling. So there's a, it's moved to downtown Boston to a show and the most recent curator is based in San Francisco and they're gonna take the show out to San Francisco. I don't know if they take the fridge, but, <laughs> but they, they definitely take the work and put it on a fridge. Um, but so this is the curated fridge um, and uh, really fun, 
and in his living room, like I've been to his, I've been to his opening. It's in a smaller space than this, um, but it's jam packed and uh, really just a fun idea, a great way to build community, to to build his own sort of connection to artists, etc. Um, so I just wanted to share some of those artists with you. There are many, many other wonderful artists in the in the Boston area, but I thought it would give you a flavor of the community and the work that people are doing. Um, and then that brings me to just sort of photography, the, the, a little bit about, uh, Shuchi asked me if I would talk a little bit about, you know, building your own portfolios and your own uh, presence, et cetera. So I thought I'd just talk about a few things um, that I've certainly found to be important. Um, and I think the first one is community, you know, community, community, community. <laughs> uh, really build your connections with people, really um, support one another, uh, talk to one another, share your work with each other. Um, it's just invaluable to have people who share your passion and who understand maybe not exactly what your particular area is, but what you're trying to do with, with, with this medium. Um, you know, of course, the technical stuff is incredibly important, right? But the ideas are incredibly important, too. And so, you know, building that community is so important. I think that's why I was so excited to see the Chennai Biennale, because I'd been coming to Chennai for years, and I kept, like, what shows are on? What shows are on? And I'd find a gallery here or there, but I never kind of found a, a center, right? So it feels like now there's a center, which is exciting. Um, you know, building a body of work, you know, so... Um, We, we can take pictures, you know, those thousand pictures I saw every day, those are great, but then how do you edit them? How do you craft them into a cohesive body of work that you can share and say, here's my idea from start to finish or from start to where I'm at now, it's in progress. So really spending time with the ideas, writing about what you're trying to achieve, um, exploring, not being afraid to go down a new direction and see where it might lead. Um, I think all those things are really important. And then just, you know, build that body of work. And when you feel like you've got kind of the bulk of it, you know, write about it. Make your artist statement. Really sort of be able to talk about the work. Why is it important? Um, journaling, I think, can be really, really helpful um, as you're exploring your ideas. And kind of it, follow it. Go in different directions. Let it challenge you. Um, let it surprise you, right? Let your own work surprise you. And then critical conversations and sharing the work, you know, getting together with other photographers. Um, it's totally different than sharing with your best friend, right? Um, who maybe is a photographer, but you know what I'm saying? It's just go with people who really are in this, in this, in this uh, pursuit. Uh, get their feedback. You'll hear different things, and some of it you'll think, yes, that makes perfect sense. Some of it you'll think, I hear you, but that's not really, I'm not going to make a change because of that. But it's really important to have the work in conversation with other photographers and others working in this area, um, curators, et cetera. Um, if you have mentoring opportunities, take them. You know, Build a mentoring group. Find a group that you can meet with once a month or once every two months or something like that. Um, if there's a particular person you really admire, um, you know, maybe there's a way you can kind of get into their presence and kind of learn from them. I think it's really important. And look at work. Look as, as much work as you can. You know, stuff you're completely familiar with, stuff that's completely way out there. Challenge yourself. What would I not normally be drawn to? Well, what can I learn from that? Um, it's important to just keep your mind growing and expanding. Um, you know, I don't know in India if you've got a lot of juried shows or not. I don't know if that, you do. So yeah, certainly I think getting into jury, you know, submitting to juried shows gets your work in front of the jurors. Even if you're not selected, it means that all these curators are seeing your work. And it might not happen tomorrow that you get a call from them, but in three years they might think, ah, I'm doing this show and this would work really well. So, you know, having that exposure, even if it's not to get the actual work on the wall at that moment in time is really helpful and important. So do submit uh, to juried shows. Some people I know work really hard to get, I don't know, 100 rejections a year, because if they've got 100 rejections a year, they've submitted to 100 things, right? I mean, that's gonna get your work out there. Um, photography competitions, um, just, you know, really just keep trying to uh, put the work out there. 
Um, if you've got the opportunity for workshops and residencies, definitely take them. Um, volunteering uh, for, for example, I'm sure there'll be some great opportunities to volunteer <laughs> with the Biennale in, in uh, February, March. You know, be connected, be close. You never know who you're going to be able to sort of meet and, and just grow from knowing. Um, and then in terms of marketing your work, you know, I think we all know websites are so important. Um, having little giveaways, you know, maybe a, a little pamphlet or something if you're going to a portfolio review, something to leave behind, business cards, all these things, Instagram, Facebook, social media. Um, you know, it's all very important part of your image um, to the world um, to sort of share, share your work. Um, portfolio reviews, at least in the States, are just incredibly valuable from a fine art point of view. Um, if, if you're not in the portfolio review scene, it's really hard to meet these curators and um, it costs money, it's an investment, you have to know that your work is ready uh, to go to a portfolio review, um, but when it is ready, it's, it's worth it. Um, you're going you're gonna to have your work seen by a variety of curators are going to get good feedback, um, and it's one of the main ways to get your work out into the world. Um, and how do you prepare for a portfolio review? Well, first of all, you have to have a strong body of work, and I would say 15 to 20 images in print, very nice print form. Um, recognize that they're going to be handled, these prints, so that they they might not come back in a pristine condition, so you can't be too wed to these prints, but you, they have to be of good enough quality that the curator or the gallerist is gonna feel like uh, you know what you're doing, <laughs> right? So really make good quality exhibition prints uh, for the portfolio reviews, um, and uh, you know, usually one or two series that you would take to the portfolio reviews. So you know, 15 or so images for each series, maybe have two series, maybe a third in your pocket if there isn't a great response, you go quickly, oh, well, maybe you'd like this one, <laughs> you know, but you need to sort of be very targeted and focused on the work that you're, you're presenting. Um, and then uh, I would say make it easy to carry, you know, si good size, at least in the States, kind of 13 by 19, I think that's a good, a good, you can see the quality of the image, you can carry it pretty well, um, it's not too unwieldy if you show up with one this big, you know, it gets to be pretty hard to carry it around. Um, so, you know, people can visualize if your actual work is this big, we can usually translate, <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, make it manageable. Um, if your work is small, like I said, my, my Bindi collection was small, it's four by six, well then I show it mounted at four by six so that you really get a sense of what it looks like. Um, there's a person in the States who's incredibly well-known, well known. her name's uh, Mary Virginia Swanson, and she has a great page on portfolio reviews, so um, you might take a note of this link here, and she just, she's the sort of absolute expert in how to do this, um, so um, you should definitely sort of check out her page when you're, when you're ready. And then I said about looking at work, I mean, Lens Scratch, do you guys know Lens Scratch? So this is a woman named Aileen Smithson who uh, was, um, in the magazine and publishing industry for many years and had been a painter and she uh, she decided to move into photography more and so 15 years ago whenever it was she made that decision she thought I'm going to do one thing a day for my photography one thing a day and it's turned into she now has this incredibly huge following on this blog called Lens Scratch and she's showing different artists work every single day um, and she now has uh, sort of people who do takeovers. She's, she'll say, okay, you're, I'm going to highlight the state of Maine, so this is my curator for Maine for the week. And you know, so she has, it's now, now they're, she's actually starting to show work from around the world. So it's a really important uh, um, website in the States anyway to follow, and it would be great as you're looking at work to, follow, to just check it out and follow it because um, you'll just see all these different ideas um, all the time. And then in the States, one of the sort of juried shows that's really um, worth submitting to, it costs money, but it's worth submitting to, it's called Critical Mass, and about 200 jurists will see your imagery. Um, and again, you may or may not make it to that finalist stage, but the movers and shakers in the photographic realm in the States will have seen your work if you submit to Critical Mass, so it's worth the investment if you feel like your work is really ready for, for that level of, of um, scrutiny. 
So those are some of the things that I would, uh, I would say, from a U.S. point of view anyway, are important. I, th I hope they would translate over. Um, Can we open it up? Yeah, I was just going to say, that's it. So yeah, so that's what I had to offer, and let's go to Q&A. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for sharing some lovely work, which I'm going to connect with you later. Okay. And Sure. So um, I don't know so much about the photojournalist element, but um, there's like a Woodstock Center for Photography. They have uh, some like week long kind of classes in the summer. There's main media workshops. Um, and what I could do maybe is try to put together a list and send it to you. Um, there's, there's a place in um, North Carolina, Penlands, P-E-N-L-A-N-D-S. Um, they do kind of week long residencies, that sort of thing. Um, those are the ones that come to mind. There's also Santa Fe. Uh, there's a big photographic center in Santa Fe, and they do a lot of different classes and courses. Um, they're usually about a week long. Um, and then there are, like, these artist residencies for a month or whatever, and those you just kind of have to search for them. You know, I don't, I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, and then there's a place in Oregon, Photo Lucida, which I think does some week-long kind of classes as well. So different kind of pockets around the U.S. Also, um, there's one in Colorado that Yuritsa, who I showed you her work, she just was at. Um, but the name is escaping me right now. I'll send you those things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A statement of purpose of the work yeah, and, the artist and the artist statement, sure. Well, so um, I, is a statement of purpose something that people ask for here? I don't hear that I phrase. So. Okay, so I think an artist statement will be very specifically about that body of work. So here's my Bindi collection, here's my artist statement about the Bindi collection. What is my statement of purpose? Would probably be what am I hoping to achieve in the residency um, or, or in my next, my next steps? You know, what is it that I'm, as a photographer, what is it that I'm trying to do in general? And then what am I hoping to achieve in a residency? If I had a month to do this, this is what I would hope to accomplish by the end of the month. I think it's more projecting out, whereas the artist statement is much more about um, the, the work that you've already produced. I have a technical question. Mm. I rarely ask technical questions, but okay. I really love the use of color and the way sometimes some of the compositions uh, that you have done, whether it's the Bindi project or whether it's the other projects that you showed us. And uh, I, I would like to know a little more about do you really focus on these things when, you're, when you see a particular frame? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I respond very strongly to color, um, and uh, so I'd say that um, those images are pretty, I, I see it as I'm shooting it, um, and then in post-production, I may boost the saturation by like three, <laughs> like a tiny, tiny bit. Um, I know I'm not somebody who goes crazy with that, but like I might just pop it a tiny bit. Um, and with the morning uh, 
morning poetry. Actually, I shot it uh, on my iPhone through a, I like chance, so I shot it through a program called Hipstamatic, which is on my iPhone, and it does all these filters and stuff. So those probably weren't quite as true to what I saw um, because it's doing all that filtering, but um, I actually really liked the effect that it, that it brought. But I do see color as I'm shooting it. But I don't always notice the details. Like it's, it's. Um, I might later realize, oh, look how this red connects to that red down there. Well, I probably saw it while shooting it, but I wasn't necessarily articulating it in my brain, right? It's more, I just absorbed it all and shot. Um, and then often you discover things in the editing process that brings it back. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I know specifically about color. I mean, I can just talk about some of the artists and the photographers who influenced me, if that's useful. So uh, I think I was initially drawn to photography through uh, photojournalism, the, the National Geographic books that I watched, you know, magazines that I looked at as a kid and thought, oh, I'd love to do that, right? Um, and then I really loved Vogue. <laughs> I'm so not a fashionista, but I loved Vogue when I was like 16 years old, and I loved the imagery there. And um, and then um, I, I learned about Annie Leibovitz um, and um, Salgado and um, uh, Maplethorpe. Those are kind of in my early days, uh, really kind of learning about photography and Edward Weston, et cetera, some of those classics. And then uh, when I went and I did my master's degree, um, I really started learning about working with the body. Um, so like Francesca Woodman is somebody who I really uh, admired her, uh, admire her work. Um, Cindy Sherman, who does a lot of, um, it's all staged imagery using herself as the, as the subject, but they're not self-portraits. Um, and she's really making societal comments on uh, female imagery, I suppose, portrayal of, of women. Um, and, um, oh golly, there's so many people that I really like. I could go on and on. Um, but I, I particularly uh, like the self-referential, uh, strong female voice. Uh, I'd say I was really drawn to, the, to those uh, types of uh, works. But, uh, you know, I also really like, um, uh, what was his name, Joel uh, Meyerowitz. Um, yeah, Joel Merowitz's work and um, Stephen Shore, et cetera. So there's, I mean, I could go on and on, but um, what's that? Sally Mann. Yeah, very much. There's a, he does. There's a great show of Sally Mann on in Boston right now. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who else, Sanjay? Who else am I forgetting? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Which one, about, sorry? Currents and poetry being presenting images, particularly for a portrait of you, or an artist's body of work, but mm -hmm. say somebody who can't be named as a fine art photographer or a photo journalist, they kind of. Mm -hmm. All over, yeah. Mm -hmm. You work as a mosaic. You kind mm -hmm. of believe that it's these images are from the same person. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's what he is. Or yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so Yeah. Uh, so how does that work? How do you, yeah, how do you connect those yeah. things? Yeah, so I take all kinds of photographs, right? But I, like even for deciding what to talk about today, I thought I'll st stick it with the Chennai piece because it's for this moment in this time. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm photographing with my iPhone all the time. You know what I mean? Just out there doing all kinds of things and often just playing, right? Um, but when you're ready to sort of share, you probably need to find a way to wrap your arms around something, mm -hmm. right? So maybe it's like, oh, for, for today, I'm going to show, you know, this, mm -hmm. these connections. And maybe they're associated in some way. They don't have to be of the same subject or a big theme, but maybe there's a way in which they connect. And, and you can sort of pull together maybe 15 images that feel like they connect. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, 
you know, if, if you're not yet sure, you could sort of live with them for a while, right? Hang them on your wall or whatever, kind of keep finding the threads of connection and then find a way to articulate those threads of connection. So they may not look the same and they might have been taken at very different times, but there's something in you that weaves them together. And, and that thread is what you can then share as you talk with others about it. Um, you can also get feedback from others about that. Like, I feel like these go together. What do you think? And one of the things that um, I get so itchy about when I see like 10 pictures together, I'm like, let me add them. I want to move them around. I want to kind of sort of just say, I think it's stronger this way. Um, and it's hard when, you're, when it's your own work because you remember all the details around it, right? I know when I took it, I know what I was feeling, I know uh, that sort of stuff, but somebody who doesn't know all that can maybe see, oh, this would actually fit better here, and this is why. And so that's why that critical conversation is so helpful, because you hear other people's thoughts on it. You go, oh, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to see that because I'm too close to it, right? Um, so. I don't think you have to be pigeonholed. I'm a fine art photographer. I'm a photojournalist. I don't think it's like that. It's more, but when you are trying to present 10 or 15 images, there has to be some thread, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly, to breathe, and, and that hanging it on the wall and kind of, you know, looking at it, walking away, coming back, you so know. So adding what you're saying, therefore, how important is it to print your work? Because mm -hmm. I'm a digital lady. I mm -hmm. never really, I mean, as a child, I used to use the old Kodak cameras and, you know, the regular uh, photographs that I family and friends, you know, photographs that I used to take. But now, as a photographer, I only shoot digital mm -hmm. and Yeah, I have exactly the same issue. I, I would love to print my work a lot more than I do. And I have this beautiful printer and it keeps getting clogged because I, just, you know, if I'm not printing it, I'm sorry, I'm like, okay, once a week I'm going to print something, you know. But I, I think that uh, our work is more securely preserved through prints than through digital media. So um, I think it's important to print. I think that um, to begin to do the kind of work you were talking about, making those associations, it might be helpful to have, I, I use a lot of little small prints. I'll do a lot of four by sixes and I'll use those as my working prints and I'll shuffle them around. And then when I'm really ready, I'll print it sort of at the size I think it should be. Um, I, I find it helps me to see it physically, to move it around, to sort of uh, make those associations. Um, and there's an artist in, in our, uh, in, uh, he's actually a retired photography teacher, and he swears that you have to print it. He said it won't exist if you don't print it. It's just, it's just going to disappear. So you know, there's definitely a great advantage to printing. But I completely understand what you're saying. It's, it's not always practical, and it's not always feasible, right? To be honest. So, yeah. Right, yeah, and it's a physical yeah. object, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. got materiality, it. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. They are all non technical ones. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What is the memorable experience in your profession? Then, B, what do you consider the best photograph which you have taken in your life? <laughs>
Wow. Wow. Okay. This is your whole life. This is. <laughs> in, in case you have already answered to my question, please repeat the answer. <laughs> Thank you, Mama. Um, <laughs> so I remember the middle question, which was the best photograph I've taken in my life. I can't possibly imagine what that would be, but um, there are surprises and there are moments that stick with you and there are the, the, the images that you pursue and then it happens, you know, you f oh, there it is. Um, and those are sort of exciting moments. And then there are those that you turn around and there's this surprise and mama, I'm gonna, this is my uncle, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about the night, the, the image I told you about the other night. I was photographing the morning poetry imagery and uh, this is uh, my uncle, Sanjay, uh, uncle. And um, he was praying as I was doing all this. And I went out, the, so the first day I did the morning poetry with my iPhone, the next day I went out with my 5D and I'm gonna get this shadow and it's gonna be amazing. And I'm gonna make up for the fact that I did everything on an iPhone. And so I was out there with like waiting for the light to just move, just move, just move, just move. And I turned around and there was Mama. He'd come out to pray to the sun, and the light was on his face. And it was the most beautiful moment that I had had in a long time. So the beauty of that light in your prayer was so special. So that was an important moment for me. Um, my goal overall is to make work that's meaningful, to share it in a meaningful way, I can't imagine not making this work. Um, it would be silencing me, and it would, it would uh, shut my spirit down. And so I have to work. <laughs> I have to do the photography. Um, and I can't remember your first question. What was the first question? I, a part A. <laughs> oh, memorable experience. Ah, yeah. Memorable experience, so. I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> so I did my master's in photographic studies and I did a final project in which I had gone to my home state and photographed this um, burning town. It was a coal mine that had caught fire underground. It had been burning all of my life. And I told my mother I was coming home to photograph this. But what I did not tell her was that I was gonna then project it in the studio and perform a dance in front of it <laughs> in, in which you know I wasn't always entirely clothed. And so, so my mother decided to come to my final exhibition in London. And I was like, oh! So, so I was a little bit embarrassed by that, but she laughed. It was really funny. She said, it's actually really funny work. So that was a very memorable experience. So, yeah, so, yep, yeah. And that's our last question for today. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, so your questions about all those different parts, the answer is yes <laughs> to all of them, right? I think, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's a re it's, there's a personal response to the work when you see it. You know, ooh, I really think this is strong. There's trying to understand what did the artist want to be portraying in the work. Um, and then I think when you're curating, you're also thinking about how do things hang together. So if it's one artist, how do those images work together? If it's a, a juried show like the one we have at the museum right now with 60 artists, each with one piece, 
how do you tie that together in a way that feels like the room is working nicely together? Uh, so it's about those associations a little bit like the thread I was talking about. You have to find that thread that goes among the images to pull them together into a show. So if you're um, looking at 25 artists' work and you have to narrow it down to maybe five, there's the individual response to the work and how is the strength of the work, the technical aspects of the work, um, and, uh, and, the, and the vision and, and the execution of the vision. But then there's also the how do the five work together? You know, so there may be all 25 might be incredibly strong, but they don't all work on the wall together. So you have to kind of edit in a way that really um, ha lets it hang together in conversation. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. Isn't that great? We can all have that, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. 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 The sense of community, uh, just to increase the process more, because uh, more formal uh, meetings or talks like this yes. are towards the you know uh, completion or showcasing mm. the completed work. Mm -hmm. Say to discuss more work in progress mm -hmm. or. Mm -hmm. This is a question to both of you. Yeah. To increase the yeah. Informal the <laughs> <laughs> so I think what you need to do. <laughs> So I think, you know, you can start things. You can do it. Like he just said, I'm going to have a show in my fridge, <laughs> right? You can say, I want to start, I want to start a, a monthly group. Put out a WhatsApp or I don't know, what, whatever you're using. You know, put out some sort of a notice, monthly crit group, monthly discussion group, pick a place to meet every third Monday or something of the week or of the month and, and just, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Have the roving fridge or something. So, you know, you can, you can make it happen, right? You don't have to wait for somebody else to make it happen. Just start it. I had a group in London where I, where I lived for those years. Um, for five years, we met once a month, and it was me, a photographer, a magician who's a professional magician, a writer, um, a, a, an energy body work specialist kind of person, and then occasional others <laughs> who came and went. And every month for five years, we just met and we talked about our work in that way. And we became really closely connected where we would know when to sort of kick each other in the butt and say, you're stalling, get out there, or, oh, I'm sorry that happened. You know, we became a real support group. And so find, you know, even two or three friends that are connected and can support you in this way, or start a group, you know, and, and that's where it's going to start. So Grassroots. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow, right? <laughs> yeah, no, really, it's, it, it's just about making it happen for yourself. You don't have to wait for somebody else to provide it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you all so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. That was Oh. It's got to do with a little bit of uh, the national holiday that was suddenly Yeah, declared. our sudden holiday, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm glad that at least a few of us could, you know, uh, get to interact with you. And we can always stay in touch. We will share Julie's email, uh, if that's okay with you. Sure. Uh, with, you know, yeah. all our people here, and they can stay in touch with you for further advice or guidance. Sure. And thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>